Let me right. tell you how this is going to be. You're going to show up at the gym about 5 o'clock. You're going to be tired as shit. You ain't going to want to go there. I'm going to beat the ever-loving shit out of you. You're going to ride a bike at the end, and you're going to puke. This sounds- you're going to go home, but damn it, by the end of it, you're going to love, love it. it. <laughs> Doesn't that sound great? Look, there's a steel ball. I want you to pick it up. You're going to swing it between your legs. It's going to look like you're humping a camel. But you know what, Sally? You're going to love it here. She's like, listen, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. But why don't you just say, listen, we're experts in this. We've been doing it for 30 years. We specialize in exactly what you're looking for. We got you. Number 15. Not even halfway there yet. Get really into politics and make it public. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I can't think of any way to bring people together, you know, and, and affect your local community better than being very politically motivated and then posting all of your political bullshit on Is that bad for social business? media. I think it probably eliminates half of your customer base. So I would think it was a bad idea. And again, this goes back to almost everything is going to go back to the number one point. Yeah. Control your emotions. You might have some very, very strong emotions about political, right? Anything political. Great. But you have to have the emotional constraint not to go online. And, and believe me, you're not doing anything on there, right? No one's listening to you. You're not changing any it's minds. It's making a difference. I have a voice too, Rick. People need to hear me. <laughs> right, I have things to say. I want to say it. And boy, when I say it, it's going to change the world. Everybody on Facebook is going to see me comment about the Krats or the Republicans, and it's going to be life-changing. No, it's not. You're in a vacuum on there. Everybody that agrees with you will high-five you. Everybody that disagrees won't say a word and they'll never come to your gym. (laughs) So it is a terrible idea. Like I would just say it's really hard if you have strong political leanings to do that, but you're nuts. If you're in any kind of business and you're blasting, it doesn't uh, help. So just leave it at that. (laughs) Yeah. Control yourself. (laughs) Control yourself. dude. All right. Number 16, go by feel. Yeah. Look, don't go by data. Like, you know, if you feel like if, if a couple of people in your gym, you're doing a new initiative and they complain, it probably means the whole gym hates you, right? <laughs> Don't look at how many it is. Just go by how you, yeah, just go by your feels that Your day. feel or their feels. Right. Just go by their feels. Either way. But how many times have you heard this when, like, we may launch a new initiative in the company and someone's like, oh, everybody hates this. I'm like, who's everybody? And you Me? dig in and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe members at your gym, like, you know, yeah, all of our members are saying this. I'm like, who's all of our members? And yeah. it's like two people. It's just Johnny and Debbie, Steve. Right. <laughs> well, you know, they're the, they're the ones. I'm like, that's three people. There's 130 people in the gym. I'm sure three people don't yeah. like it. We're going to be just fine. Well, I mean, in a, in a gym setting, I mean, look, you get a lot of different people in there, and they all have their own lives. There's a lot of emotion in just having a trainer and coming in working on yourself, so – just as an owner, be ready for those conversations and uh, be able to, uh, you know, disperse them and make them. <laughs> yeah. Well, look <laughs> at your those. data, like everybody, <laughs> who's everybody, right? That kind of idea. But same kind of thing. Like if you get some feedback that's not great, goes back to not reacting right away. Zoom out a bit. Really think about it. Is it everyone? Is there something there? Is it overwhelming evidence? Does the data back up your feelings about what somebody's telling you or saying or their feelings? I mean, I think you should overreact immediately. (laughs) Oh, I do. Go on social media and talk about it. (laughs) Go on social media and blast it. All the things. You could probably probably do all the shitty advice I'm giving here in one event. (laughs) All right, number 17, pay low, aim high. Yeah, look, if you want to build an amazing team, pay well below market and treat your employees like crap. I think that's a great strategy, right? (laughs) Do you know Henry Ford? You know, Henry Ford said this at one point. He's like, I, the best thing I ever did for productivity in my business is I gave everyone a raise. So he paid above market rate and then his team performed much better because of it, right? Doesn't always the case, but I think what he's trying to get at is like, if you want great talent on your team, you can do all they want. You can put nap rooms in there, free coffee. You can do all the things, right? Ping pong, all the things, but it's not going to mean shit if you can't, people can't keep a roof over their head and feed, feed their family. So it's like, you got to pay at least market rate. And if you can afford it, I will tell you, the more you pay, the better quality individual that you're going to get. Yeah, I mean, do you think the big companies are hiring the average Joe's folks and paying them nothing and that's how they got there? <laughs> well, exactly. And especially if you're a smaller company where each individual hire is so much more critical. Like if you're a franchisee of Alloy, you've got to hire a good operator. Well, I would do some profit share with that person just 
again, I can't tell you to do it, but I would do it because I want the highest quality individual in that yeah. seat as possible. And I'm willing to shave off 3% profit margin or something to have someone that compelling in my business. And so if you pay peanuts, you know, that's what you're going to get. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. Number 18. If you ain't first, you last. <laughs> that don't even make sense. <laughs> Ricky Bobby. <laughs> Hell, Ricky, I was high when I said that. (laughs) (laughs) That don't even make sense. You come in third, fifth. He's like, I based my whole life on that. (laughs) I don't even know why that one's in there. Yeah, me neither. Now that I'm doing movie quotes, I'm like, why did I put that in there? No, I I think it's it goes back to like you're not somebody always bigger, better, faster, smarter is out there, right? Maybe perceptionally. It's yes, the best that's what I meant. Have. I mean, just focus on what you're doing. Yeah. You know, like you can look out there and like you've said this before, you you put this very uh, well last week in our podcast when we were talking about how to look at your local competition. And you were like, you don't even know. You're totally making assumptions on their success based right. on like, a, what do you see on social media and their offerings? So why would you react they to that? happy over there. Right. Well, look how good they're doing. It's like, it goes back to almost like the personal thing where you're like, oh, man, everybody's life's curated. Well, you don't think their businesses are curated? Of course they are. So you can't base their success, and that's no reflection on you. But the reality is there is going to be people bigger, better out there. Who cares? Yeah. Put your head down. Do your work as best as you possibly can. That's the most effective use of your time. So we don't a- get caught up in like, if we're not the best, then screw it. Right. We have a motto in our, my, my neighborhood and it's, you know, if you lose it, something or whatever you're not doing, it's just get better. Literally have it on our golf carts as we drive around. It says get better. Dude, I love your neighborhood. I'm moving <laughs> up there. They, Go, come on. You with your do your job shirt and your get better your golf job, cart. Get better. Jeez. I love that. <laughs> but that, I mean, yeah, words of that <laughs> shit. All right. Number 19, start arguments on social media. We kind of talked about this already. <laughs> yeah. I think, look, if it's, an, you can go on there. Outside and, of politics. Well, you can do politics if you want. I think just posting anything political, even if it's not derogatory towards the other party, we're so divided, you're going to get a reaction. Now, beyond that, why don't you just get on there and argue about anything, right? I see this all the time. This happens more at the trainer level. People will be hair splitting over like uh, the FMS or whether they should use kettlebells or whether someone should do barbell squats or this. And I'm just like, what are you doing? I mean, just the fact that you spent time to go on there and post something negative and who are you blasting it to? (laughs) No one cares what you think, right? To your point, like everybody wants to feel like they have a voice. No one cares. You're not changing anybody's mind on social media. It is a total waste of time. And you'll see these threads that we're in on these coaching threads and stuff. And it's like this back and forth. And you're just arguing about the silliest things. And I'm like, how much time and distracted mental attention did that person put? Maybe it made them a little angry and that sets you off your game. Like if your emotions get up, you don't make good decisions and you can't refocus on the work that you're supposed to do that day. You literally spent 20 minutes ruining the rest of your day arguing over kettlebell form or something I, so I will silly. say I, I do like looking at those people the comments that come from those things i do <laughs> the trolls that start those because <laughs> they're well, really funny yeah we laugh about like there's these like neighborhood <laughs> threads of everybody's neighborhoods and it's like i will log on there at night like when my day's over just for entertainment value and great. just laugh at people arguing but never in a million years would i ever participate in that and, you know, sometimes you're just like, wait a minute, that's not right. And you're like, I'm a, and then you, it takes a split second. And you're like, what am I doing? This is not going to help anything. No. And why would I waste any time <laughs> doing this? Cause it's just going to anger people. So stay off social media. Listen, I've set a limit on mine. I've got like a time limit, like total for, I got it broken down for each one. And then I have a total time limit for the day. And once it times out, I don't get on anymore. So Look I would highly suggest using that time management skills. Very, very disciplined, Matt. Just, do you have big buttons on your phone? Because you can't. That's yeah, a jitterbug. Them. Okay, I'm 53. <laughs> All right, number 20. Burn the ships. Yeah, look. If you're going to go into business, have zero backup plan. Go all in with all your money and all your resources, and that's exactly what the glorified entrepreneurship gurus are going to tell you. I went all in. And I've said this before, if you're living in a van down by the river and you have zero assets to protect, sure, go all in. Because what do you have to lose? You end up in a smaller van down by the river? I mean, that's not a bad, <laughs> that's not a bad trade-off, right, for the upside. But I'll tell you this. I don't know anybody that's really successful that doesn't take a very hard look at every opportunity and what the opportunity costs are, mm-hmm. real and or bandwidth or whatever those things are. Like mm-hmm. it can be real money or it can just be attention or whatever those things are. 
So burn the ships. If somebody doesn't know what that is, that means that, you know, there's a true story about this. I forgot who it was, but it was an explorer. And when they landed somewhere, he didn't want his guys to like chicken out and go back. So he literally burned all the ships. They were stuck there. Mm. Right. So it was a real strategy, a real story. <laughs> but then it became a business um, analogy where like, hey, go all in with no backup plan. Like there's no way but forward. And that sounds very uh, cavalier and it sounds like, oh, that's, you know, it's romantic, right? But it's bullshit. I don't know anybody that's successful that doesn't look at the downside of something and ask themselves, could I withstand the worst case scenario? You right. should be asking yourself that, right? Period. And if you can't, if you, if your answer is no, don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> not a good idea. I mean, if you're on the very bottom, you got nothing to lose. That's one thing. But if you've got assets and you have a family to protect and you've so got a willing business. To risk it all. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> just willy nilly, man. <laughs> Throw caution to the wind, burn the ships. And you tell yourself these things because it's romanticized, but it's, I don't know anybody successful in business that operates that way. Word up. All right. Number 21, sell the braces, not the smile. Yeah. Look, the analogy there is like if an orthodontist. You know, instead of selling you the end game, like the result of what's going to happen by getting braces, which is a beautiful smile, and they just sold you the process, right? You'd never do it. Like, hey, we're going to you know, glue these things to your teeth. It's going to tear up your gums. We're going to tighten them up so you're not going to eat an apple for like three years. Your mouth's going to be really sore. You're like, no, I'm out. Don't sell the process. I think fitness is very similar to that, right? Absolutely. I mean, you want to paint the picture. In a lot of ways, we let clients do it. Like, hey, if this goes as well as as we expect it to, and you follow my advice, tell me what you, you feel and look like in a year from now. Right. And then you can do the inverse of that. Cause there's the carrot and the stick. So the, the positive visualization is the carrot. What if you do nothing today and you decide not to join here and, and you continue to flounder, what do you look like in a year from now? And it's like, well, my knees hurt worse. I'm, I've gained more weight, you know, I'm right. not happy. And you let people paint their own negative picture. Let me right? tell you how this is going to be. You're going to show up at the gym about five o'clock. You're going to be tired as shit. You ain't going to want to go there. I'm going to beat the ever living shit out of you. You're going to ride a bike at the end and you're going to puke. This sounds, you're going to go home, but damn it, by the end of it, you're, you're going to love, love it. it. <laughs> Doesn't that sound great? Look, there's a steel ball. I want you to pick it up and swing it between your legs. It's going to look like you're humping a camel. But you know what, Sally? You're going to love it here. She's like, listen, I'm out. But why don't you just say, listen, we're experts in this. We've been doing it for 30 years. We specialize in exactly what you're looking for. We got you. We all know that between here and there is a lot of things. Most of involve a you know, four letter word, which is work, right? But there's going to be a lot of shit that has to happen in between there. But if you try to sell that, yep. you're going to swing and miss. It's the same thing in franchising. I don't think it's really lost on anyone that running a small business is difficult. But when people come in, I don't say this is going to suck so bad. You're going to have to upskill yourself. You're going to have to grow personally. You're going to have to be a good leader. You're going to have some people that that do really well by you. You're going to have others that don't. You know, you're going to have some sleepless nights every now and then. You know, I don't say that, but that could be the reality. Maybe not every time, but it could be, right? But what sure. you say is like, hey, if you can keep it together and follow our lead and we'll help you navigate becoming an entrepreneur as well, here's what you could look like in five years, right? Yeah. You paint that picture. That's the sale. And that's true doesn't doesn't change the fact that there's a lot of work in between <laughs> all right number 22 make it all about you <laughs> yeah i find the most effective marketing techniques especially in the fitness space is just to post you doing super dope workouts you know maybe take a bunch of pictures with your shirt off and stuff and i find that's very motivating like you know if you own a gym all your videos and stuff should be about all the cool things that you do i mean you just just called out basically 50 percent of the personal trainers probably in the world right there well, you're on you're on blast, folks. Sorry. <laughs> you know where I live. Come get some. <laughs> I did this workout today. Right. Check it out. Yeah, man. Look, I and I'm not saying that because like I've done it. Like I think I posted one shirtless pick in the last 30 years, and it was when I was turning 50, and it's because I was in good shape. And I was like, all right, I'm 50. Look so at alloy. Midlife crisis. This is what alloy does. And I'm having a midlife crisis. Also got a Corvette and a really young girlfriend. But sorry, babe. Just kidding. <laughs> but what was the rumor? I'm living with a Brazilian girl or something like that. Two, yeah. Two of them. <laughs> look at me. I'm unbelievable, right? I sold the gym, live in Brazil to get you chicks. Oh, man, I'm balling out of control. I'm like, I saw him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> he was just here. He didn't live in Brazil. He was just working. Yeah, man, it's crazy, right? But uh, but I think a lot of fitness professionals do that. And and maybe they're thinking in their minds that they're being aspirational. But it, it – geez, I'm trying to say this because it's not always this way. But a lot of times I see it as like self-serving, all about you. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a difference. I mean, if you're out there promoting and really you believe in it, and this is the way, I get it. Let yeah. me take it. <clears throat> God, whiskey got me. <laughs> I'm a rookie. Matt's stuck three glasses in. I'm over here choking down on one. Um, <laughs> Your sink. eyes are water. <laughs> oh, yeah, but choke came out of my nose. Whiskey in the nose is a painful as hell. <laughs> getting weird um let's say that you do the same thing with your business like you start your business and it's your idea that your business is there to serve you yeah so you only put your favorite things in the business you don't build the machine based on what the market tells you they want right you build it what you think is super dope and you hope that what you think is dope the general your market also thinks is really cool right right Sometimes they don't. So I would say the mature way to approach a business is that whole jobs to be done theory that we've talked about. What is the job of my product or service to this customer avatar? Build the machine that serves that and then power that. And don't worry about what your personal likes or dislikes are. Did you ever bring in your personal dopeness into the gym? I've never been dope. I'm never dope been dope? free my whole life. Never yeah. t- try, to, try to force break dancing on people? No, I didn't. Even though I was a rock star, at that, I never, I never, I didn't think it was appropriate for a crowd. Now that I'm that age, I was right. I do not want to break dance right now. I was right. Nailed it. Maybe at the Christmas party this year, I'll show uh, break off a little something for you. Number twenty three, charge less. Yeah, look, the best way to have an advantage in your market is to be the lowest price person. Yeah, everybody that's loves that place. Yeah, race to the bottom. Be the low price guy. Yeah. Tell your market that you're the worst person in the market. And the only reason they should come to you is for price. And plus, the side benefit, Matt, is it attracts price-sensitive customers, which are so easy to deal with. Those are the best ones. (laughs) Honestly. (laughs) I love those. Well, it's true. I mean, in in all seriousness, the people that paid the least were always the biggest pain in the ass. Always. And so, again, I didn't like them, but they were the big pain in the ass. Well, yeah. Well, exactly. I'm not like, listen, being a a really demanding, hard-to-please customer is different than I don't like you personally. And so thank you for clearing that up but 100 percent, like the less you charge the price sensitive customer is the one that always is going to traditionally expect a lot more and expect it for way less money that's not our customer avatar at alloy we're going into markets where we're going to charge you know a lot of money for personal training and i will tell you what's interesting is the higher that you get your price threshold the better your customers are some of it is the psychology about it's disruptive enough like hey i'm spending 400 dollars a month on personal training I'm going to use this damn thing, yeah, right? Skin the game, buy in. Yeah. yeah, like $10 gym membership, you'll keep that just to, just to keep that promise to yourself that maybe come Monday you're going to start. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back. I mean, I got a gym. I'm going to get I'm back. Member, I'm a member up here at the gym. I just need to get in there. And when's the last time you're in there? Oh, like 20, 2019. <laughs> but I mean, I've been paying. I'm going to keep going in there. You know, it's that kind of idea. And so for us, I like a high press threshold because it drives more engagement. So the worst thing you can do is running low barrier hooks and and – Again, competing in your market on price, like compete on service, be the best at that. And if you can, there are at least in our case, 130 people in those markets that will pay it because we're putting them in a a target rich environment. Yeah. just I mean, the the buy-in is huge. I mean, somebody, if you're paying $300, $400 a month for training, you're going to be really invested. You're going to pay attention to what they're telling you. You you want it. And when you say it like that, what I hear is like you're doing the customer. It sounds strange and sounds like a justification, but it's true based on the psychology. You're doing your customers a favor by charging them enough to actually take advantage of the service. Because if they don't show up and get in front of you, you can't help them. Right. Right. So like charge them enough. You have, you know, my famous story about a rule and, you know, he's a great dude. He had canceled a bunch. He was a savvy business guy. Yeah. And he was mad because he had stacked up all these late fees and charges and he sat down with a guy, Joe, at the time, who was a master of this kind of stuff. And, and he sat down and said, well, clearly, this is not enough of financial burden for you to get you to the gym. So before you get upset about the late charges or like the no-shows or whatever, well, let's talk about where you've been. Like you committed to me as your coach that you're going to be here 12 times a month. You're coming in average of six times. You're ne- and then you're never going to reach your fitness goals. And so by the time that conversation was over, you know, this really savvy business guy understood that we were really using price and and a in a stick if you will financial stick to get him to do the things that he needs to do to be successful like that's what a coach does is they hold you accountable yep. and if and if money or if there's a, a punishment involved in that in some way that's not too you know egregious it can really help that's why we do it it's not a money grab mm-hmm. right it's a it's a listen whatever we can do to get your attention to get you to show up and do the things we need you to do we're going to do it and if it's money then so be it yeah all right 
What was that, 23? All right, 24. Say it once, never say it again. <laughs> yeah, look, as a leader, if never I tell my team something one time, they better know it. I never want to remind them again, ever. <laughs> You've never done that. <laughs> Just say it once and be like, why don't you guys understand? How come you don't get this? Didn't I say this three weeks ago? So the, the best thing about Rick, who makes him really good, is he remembers everything. And you literally tell him once and he never forgets. <laughs> Which is amazing, and his expectation is you're you're on the same plane, or right. the same boat as him. Right. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'm not great at this one. It's like, but well, some of these you had to have. You said you did them. Yeah. Well, this is one I'm bad at because I think really fast and I talk a lot, and it's like, okay, here's the idea, and you know, and I'm da 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 da, and then I'm like, got it, got it, and then I'm done. They're like, why don't we have this? And I remember exactly what we said, who was wearing what, That's where amazing. they were sitting in the room, voice flexion, look on their face. And then it doesn't happen, and I'm shocked. Well, not everyone's wired that way, and plus, you guys have to like take those things and put them into play, which is much, you know, much more difficult than just coming up with the idea. But I will tell you that you need to prepare yourself if you're in any leadership role. You know, we jokingly describe most of the roles in the C-suite like I'm the chief reminding officer, uh -huh. right? And you've used different terms for that as well, like for the say the operator, operating partner in one of our clubs, mm -hmm. you're going to be reminding your part-time training staff of the same things forever. Like you're going to have to say the same thing. Sure. It's going to have to, and that's part of your culture. You got to remind people of the core values. You got to coach to the seven core tenets you, and you have to be relentless. So if you are, if your expectation is that you're going to train it once and they're going to know it forever, you are sadly mistaken at any level, no matter how right. talented the team is, it's going to be reminding, 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 uh, because again, we talked about, it's not complicated. The hard part is doing the basics well over and over again. The way that you get your team to do that is you remind them consistently of the things that need to be done. Right. Remind your team, which in turn reminds, gets them to be on it to remind the clients, which in helps with like why we are even business in the first place is because people need help, right? They've obviously heard probably what we're going to tell them to get in shape and lose weight. <laughs> right. If they would have listened the first time. They've probably been and did it. Yeah, I mean, look, fun. they can go online and, and read the info. What we're really doing is getting them to show up. So they have to like face us two or three times a week. Right. And guess what you're doing every time? You're reminding them. Same thing with clients. Same thing with your team. Yeah. Same thing with culture. At every level, do you're going to have to be relentless and you're going to feel like you're in this Groundhog Day loop of repetitiveness. And it's not fun. And you will tell yourself sometimes, I don't understand why I have to keep saying this. Now, you can put some SOPs and stuff in place, some processes and things sure. to help with that. But at the end of the day, even if they're there, you're going to have to remind people that they're there and that they need to stick to them and they need to keep doing them. So you just need to get yourself wired and, and, and set up so that, look, look, I'm going to be reminding people of these things from now until the end of time. That is my job, if you will. Do your job. Yeah, but what what business is in not like that? Like every business is like, or just you know, we always go to sports and do your job. You know how many times probably Nick Saban has probably told this the, you know, the quarterback to look for this, to look for that, like you know, or the linebacker, whatever, over and yeah, over. You think he just told him once and he's got it forever? <laughs> no. no, he's going to keep <laughs> saying the same thing right. over and over again, and it's like even then it's still difficult to execute at a good level for a consistent long period of time. So. To do that, just be prepared to say the same things over and over. Yep. Love this one. This is another, another one of my favorites. Have at least three business partners. Yeah, look, I think the more hands that are in the cookie jar in any business from a decision-making standpoint, the easier things are going to be. Yeah, it doesn't cloudy anything. It probably no. doesn't mess anything up. No, not at all. And especially if you don't have a clear operating agreement with who does what. Mm. you just like, hey, we're three bros. We're cool. There's four of us. That one bro ain't doing anything. Yeah, I know, like, exactly. He, he ain't pulling up his end of the bargain. Right. Well, he don't even know what that is because you didn't <laughs> remind him of it 400 times. He didn't even know what he's supposed to be doing, right? So I will say this. like a, Your partnership is outside of your marriage, which is your real partnership. Your business partnership is the most critical. If you have bad partners, man, you are in for a tough, tough trip. You know. Yeah. So pick your partners, and I would say too many hands in the cookie jar is very confusing typically. I was just listening to a great podcast, and it was more about like, franchise businesses and what big investors look like. So say that we're four years down the road and we've got a private equity coming in to look at us. One of the big checks in the no box, if you will, is again, this too many investors in the business and they all have these different influences. And right. sometimes 
like again, we're the unicorn that's bootstrapped the whole thing. Like we don't have any outside investors. We never have, which yeah. is awesome. If we can continue to grow like this and we've got a runway, it looks like we're going to be able to, we're going to be the unicorn because most people don't have the advantage of having 30 years in business and a licensing business to fund this thing. Right. So what they do is they get like venture capital money out of the gate. So then the next guy that comes along, the first like real investor after the seed investor, the original one, mm -hmm. right? He's kind of second to the trough now, right? Because he's got to deal with this venture capital company that funded the thing out of the gate. So he's got to deal with them. So it's not that clean. Mm -hmm. And then this guy has a runway. He wants to go four or five years and he wants to sell it again, right? And so each one of those steps gets more complicated the more people are involved. But that first step is really critical. And it's the hardest one to avoid because typically – I mean, your equity is the most valuable thing that you have in your company, and it's very easy to give it away early on, mm -hmm. but it's the most valuable thing, so you should avoid that if you can. But when you're really desperate and you need 5000 from this relative and hundred grand from this seed investor and a million over here, I mean, you're willing to give away the farm because you feel like you're really desperate. But if you can avoid that and strategically find partners that not only can give you money, but that have strategic value to the business, right? right? So it's one thing if you partner with a VC firm that was very aligned and they knew, let's say us, they knew a lot about fitness or they knew a lot about franchising because they had a lot of experience there. They would not only be bringing their money to the table, they would be bringing a lot of expertise and bandwidth. That's okay, maybe, right? If you need the money, you need the money. Again, we're rare in that case. But I think if you have, again, people that all they're bringing is money, and then now they have some influence. And then when you do want to do an exit at some point, you've got 15 people at the table and they all get their hands in the cookie jar and they'll have different ideas about what the valuation should be and everything. It's going to be a nightmare. And let's just pare it down to like a small business even. I mean, I've had scenarios where I've had four people in this conference room and they're like, yeah, we're going to start this fitness business together. And I'm like, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> like this is way too many partners. <laughs> do you guys have an operating agreement? Like who's going to do what? Now these aren't franchisees. This is just more consulting right, right. before we got to franchising. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, he's going to do this and he's going to do that. None of it worked out. The whole thing imploded. The one guy didn't like the job that he was given in the company. I got a crap job. And, and he left. And the guys that had put the money in were like, they weren't going to work in the business. Now they're stuck with this business with nobody running it. It's like, man. So I've just seen it time and time again. Like, Keep partnerships lean. Only give away equity if there's money and a strategic value add to the business. And don't do it if you, if you can't, if you don't have to. Got it. Number 26. I think we've touched on this one a little bit. I don't know. Avoid hard things. Yeah, I think um, you know, don't don't make hard decisions. Don't have hard conversations now. Just wait till things get critical. And I think the 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 real advice there is what we said before, which is hard conversations now or harder conversations later. Yeah. I mean, just definitely avoid all conflict. It'll it'll go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just look the other way. How many people do this in their business right now, though? Like I was talking to a guy the other day, and he's, he's had somebody in his business for like seven years. And he's like, I don't know what to do with this guy. He's He wants to leave. He's kind of toxic. And of course, you know, now that I'm zoomed out a little bit and I'm not in that situation, it's very easy to see what's going on. I'm like, well, there's no upward mobility for this guy. Of course, he's grouchy. And he's he's like sort of fighting for more space and more money and more responsibility. But you've got one gym there's nowhere for this guy to go, right? Of course he's going to go. You should actually be proud of the fact that you had right. someone that long that developed beyond you, and you should be high-fiving them out the door and helping them with their next opportunity in an ideal world, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, man, it's uh, it's interesting. But those kind of conversations, having those, because um, I would say, well, sit down with them and see what they really want. If you're not the guy, commit to him that you'll help him find his next opportunity with your reach in the industry. So don't oh, avoid really? It. It's like, huh? Don't avoid it. <laughs> It'll take care of Matt's itself. Sketching up. Hang on. What? <laughs> uh, don't avoid it. Well, yeah. I mean, a hundred percent and things and will work. Out. Here's one thing that's interesting too. Um, some people are good at certain hard things. We've talked about this before. So certainly in, in the fitness industry, we see this. So you might have somebody that is like really good at like really hard workouts. Like maybe they're a CrossFitter and they're a competitor, right? Or maybe they do hundred mile running races, or maybe they do mountaineering or something physically really hard. Right. And, they double down on that and that becomes their, their hard thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, I do cold plunge and I do all these other things. It's like, okay, great. Yes. It's not fun to get in a cold tub, but I will tell you that doesn't cross over always to the other vertical that you need to do hard things in. So you're doing hard things, but you're doing them in a, in a, in a realm that you're really comfortable with. They're not actually hard for you. Exactly. <laughs> you actually deep down kind of like running a hundred miles. 
You right. don't necessarily like learning P and L's and leading people, right? right? And holding and and again, you know, saying the same thing over and over and over. You don't like that. You don't understand why you have Makes to do it. You don't like it. Well, don't don't be uncomfortable. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what we found that like, especially in fitness, people are good at hard physical things, and they're like, I can do hard things. I'm like, yeah, but you can only do them in, in areas that you like. The real hard work might be like, say, it's personal, like me, you know patch up your relationship with your spouse or, you know, patch up the relationship with your estranged, you know, cousin or, or sibling or something. That's really, really hard work. So would you rather have your own gym and have to figure out all these things on your own and how to deal with these hard conversations or you like have somebody in your corner to help you? I feel like this is uh, going somewhere. <laughs> I, I think I'd like to have somebody help me, Matt. What do you no, I mean, at? it's either from time to time. I do a lot of business coaching, help people. I mean, you know, so just just say employees in general, nobody stays forever, or there may be an employee that's not you know all aboard doing everything you want them to do. You need help in these situations, right? How to have these hard conversations, right? How to tackle hard things, yeah. And then once you do them, you get better at them. But it's better if I have a guide <laughs> versus yeah, it goes back to the tour guide, right? Yeah. Hire the local tour guide who's had these conversations yeah. hard before and has and understands how hard it is, but right. can also say, I know it's hard, but it needs to happen, and here's why. Right. And, and if you don't. This is also what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it, you can avoid it for now, but I'm telling you, it's going to be much harder later down the road. I just let it fester. Um, number 27, build an elaborate morning routine. You look like a morning routine guy. Oh, 100%. Like, I'll get up and I'll have some matcha. Is that what it is? Matcha. I'll have <laughs> that. Know. Maybe a chai tea. I'll do a cold plunge, a journal. I get in the sauna. I do some meditation. I do some more journaling. I plan my day. And then it's like one o'clock, so I take a nap, and then I and then I just you know work a little bit in the afternoon. You do so, you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I we we joke about this because you know there's very successful people that I know that don't do anything. Some of them sleep late. <gasps> Some of them don't make their bed. What? Yeah, right? I hate making the bed. It has no bearing on how much money you're going to make. Uh, you None sent me that. a thing one time when the the, the naval officer. Yeah, but I think people take that. He didn't literally mean make your bed. What he said was, and this is what people think, like, yeah, I get up every day and make my bed. I'm like, I don't care if your bed's made. That's not going to mean shit about your bed. I make it messier before I leave. (laughs) You just get in there and do like uh, cover angels, like like snow angels in the bed. And your wife's like, what are you doing? But I mean, I think people take it literally. It's like a parable, right? He's basically saying, listen, like do the little things. right. You'll never be able to do the big things right if you can't do the little things right. I would say, yeah, that goes back to all the little things we've been talking about. That's what he meant. It wasn't literally get up and make your bed. What? <laughs> but people take it that way. So somehow you think if you make your bed you're in the morning, person? you're going to have a better business. Or you're going to like, if I get up at four in the morning, I'm I'm hustling, I'm grinding. I'm like, listen, I don't hear the most successful people ever talk about their hustle and their grind. It's like, those are people that are on the journey that haven't figured it out yet. And they're not working that smart. Nobody works like that and is successful. It's ridiculous. It's not sustainable. (laughs) So to say that you outwork everyone is bullshit. Like I know, like you're not digging ditches, by the way, you're not outworking that guy I saw this afternoon in the heat out there, you know, putting down asphalt, that guy's outworking you tenfold. So don't even go there with like, I work harder than everybody else. And it's not even the smartest way to work. It's the worst metric to measure because it has no bearing on your overall success level. Yeah. Smarter, not harder. That's my, 100%, that's my motto. Dude, 100%. 100%. <laughs> I'm going to be efficient as possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get as much sleep as I can. All right. Uh, number 28. If you like working out, you should open a gym. Yeah, look, if you have a hobby, <laughs> if you have a hobby that you want to hate later, open a business that does that hobby. And I, I know guys that have that are my motorcycle buddies that have opened like motorcycle maintenance shops. They yeah. freaking hate it, and then they don't even ride motorcycles anymore. <laughs> Same thing with a gym. If you think owning a gym is all about like working out, and how many people like think that? Even our clients will say like, "Oh, it must be awesome working at the and that you own gyms because you must get to work out all day every day." I'm like, "No, it's a business." <laughs> <laughs> and it requires the same thing as every other business. It just screams CrossFit. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, look. I mean, look at that. Like, there are some very successful uh, businesses that are CrossFit, but they're in. I say a lot. There, there are some, and they're in the minority. Most of those were like side hustles and hobbies, right? Which is why they're on the. They've been on the downslide for so long, as far as like a business structure. But yeah, you don't you don't open a gym because you're really into fitness. Like that's not the only reason, right? Because you're going to have to learn a lot of skills that you currently don't have, and you're not going to like any of them. It goes back to the hard thing. Like, I can work out hard. That doesn't mean you can manage hard, hire with <laughs> manage conviction. Manage hard. <laughs> hard manager. 
It worked for me. Yeah, it sounds terrible. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's going to cross over to like business acumen. So it's like, that's the worst reason to open a business because it's your hobby. Now, it's one thing to like, hey, I like working out. I'm a consumer of it. I understand, I understand the market because I, I do it. And like a lot of our franchisees are in the same age bracket. They're like, I would buy this service if it was in my market. That's nice because they can connect the dots. On, they can see other people buying it as well. So it makes right. them easy to, to connect the dots there. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like if you're a fitness enthusiast, it's the worst reason to open a gym. And typically, if that's why you did it, you're not going to be very successful. Well, it's like every – I say every. You know, you ever speak, spoke to like a chef, right, and they, in there flipping burgers, making pizza or whatever. They freaking hate pizza and burgers. <laughs> they don't want to be there anymore. Right. So you take something that you love that was like a hobby. Like I always tease Andrea and like open a bake shop because she likes to bake. But if, if you put her in a business and she had to, you know, bake every morning, be there early to make donuts or whatever, she would she wouldn't enjoy that. Yeah. It's not fun. It's a hard business. And so you want to get into a business that provides you the level of income that you want and a lifestyle that you like. And it's just so happens. I like the, this like it's a bonus that what we do happens to be something that i like right mm -hmm. that i'm i believe in it put it this way but i'm not so blinded by my love for something also goes back to like well i love fitness but i don't just like fitness i like this type of fitness right like, i am a power lifter so i'm going to open a business that just services power lifters just i'm like great there's, blind to everything, there's right? three of them in your entire market right or I'm again, I'm a CrossFit guy. I'm going to open a gym that does CrossFit, but you open next to a golf club. It's like, okay, those aren't your people, right? <laughs> so there's more to it than just than just loving it. All right, number 29. We're getting close. Everybody deadlifts. I'm not sure why this was one in there, but it's great. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I think if you're 50 years old and you've never worked out, you should be doing a max deadlift. I think it's a really smart way to do it's it. It's just another way to phrase basically what you just said, right? It's your own likes and whatever you know, beliefs you're going to put it on everybody <laughs> traditionally and personal training if you work out with a bodybuilder you're doing lots of reps right yeah and you're doing volume yep. if you train with a power lifter you're working on the basic lifts right if you train with a triathlete you're doing a bunch of cardio if you train with somebody that likes zumba you're dancing around i mean if you train with uh, there's a guy down the street good trainer but he's got some weird functional thing he does everybody does that it's like if all you have is a hammer everyone's a nail so again, don't take your favorite thing. It, it takes a lot of maturity to disassociate what your favorite thing is from what the thing that the person in front of you needs. And typically, if it's like an older person that fits into our age bracket, they're not going to care about their max deadlift. You might say they do, but the only reason they care is because you care. And so they're like, okay, I guess this is what I'm supposed to be doing, right? And I think Mike Boyle put it really well once where, you know, the risk to benefit ratio for some of these things that you're 23, that you're having a 55 year old do, it's mm. a different, you're talking about a different animal at right. that point. Like, what did he say? Like, yeah, I hurt my back doing this deadlift. So when, you know, it would be like analogous to putting your hand on the stove and burning it and then asking someone, when is my hand going to heal? So I can put it back on the stove again. <laughs> right. That's a lot of what happens when you get older is you start, you look at something and I'm not saying deadlift is the only thing i mean it's not that's not necessarily an, it, again that's not a dangerous exercise everything is depends on the individual dosage load everything got it but we're using that as an example um it, the risk of benefits not there it's not worth it for your market you, my so. 90 year old grandmother shouldn't do heavy deadlifts with all her health with issues a and a bad back yeah, probably not okay. i mean call me crazy fine all right last two it's gonna get a little weird sleep with clients number 30 yeah look i mean it, it could seemingly seem like a great you know client retention strategy to sleep with your clients <laughs> but i think just based on the history and what i've seen from coaches that have done it you know it's not good it doesn't work out you know it doesn't like we had a guy here at one point and i didn't know this till after he left he was working at a different place slept with a client i didn't know that Ended up here for a long while. So actually did pretty good for a while. Avoided it. Slept with one of our clients. Let him go. Ended up at another competitor in our market. Slept with a client there. So, I mean, this is clearly a, a long, illustrious career and a really bad pattern. None of those things end well. No. And I can't see that not working out. 
Well, look, if you're, I mean, if you're going to sleep with somebody, do it well, first of all, like be good at it, right? Like make it a good <laughs> service that's worth it. So practice, get good at your craft. Get good at your craft. All right, bring your A game. And yeah. maybe, maybe you charge for it. But listen, there's a lot of digital solutions for that these days. You can go onto OnlyFans and just show pictures of your feet and it doesn't affect your clients. And like, look, you're, you're solid. So that would be my suggestion. So we're going to start a personal training OnlyFans business? I love that idea. I'm yeah. sure there's. I'm pretty sure they're all out there. Isn't that an eighth line of revenue for us now? Like I think we go. We we waste some time looking into that. Well, we started the feet company earlier, so this will be nine. <laughs> it's our ninth company. <laughs> I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day. He's like, "I'm running eight companies." I'm like, "No, you're not. You got like eight half baked side hustles. Like, <laughs> pick something and go all in on that. That takes guts, and that's really where you where you make hay." All right, the last one, number thirty one: <laughs> ways to fail in business, fitness business. Start a podcast. I love that one. <laughs> That's perfect, right? I hope anybody that lasted the whole thing. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> you Don't made do it. what we're doing because it doesn't doesn't pay the bills. We didn't do anything work-wise. We've been in here talking for an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of shit to do, and we spent an hour and a half in here make, you know, being ridiculous and drinking whiskey in the middle of the day, which we'll go back to work, which should be interesting, but... I would say that I've heard this from a lot of people, and I, I think it, I think I understand, Matt, you touched on this earlier, we kind of giggled. It comes from the need to feel like you have something very important to say. Yes. And so I'm going to start a podcast, and I'm going to say those things, yeah. right? Look, I'll be totally transparent, and I've said this before. This podcast, we originally started it, you know, much to my chagrin, by the way, I did not want to start a podcast because it's like everybody has one was my idea. Why would I, why would anybody care what I have to say? That's sort of where my headspace and yours as well. It's mm -hmm. like, I'm very humble that way. And I'm like, I'll just, I'll just go do work. I mean, I don't care. Like I just want to produce outcomes. Right. Sure. But our marketing company really pushed us. Now it turns out it is kind of fun to articulate ideas and we build this thing for franchise development. So if we find that candidates have questions about be, becoming good leaders, entrepreneurs, processes, what's our tech stack, what's our, you know, what are our philosophies on programming, whatever those things are, it's really helpful for that. So that's really why we build it. And then just so happens that there's some good advice in there for other fitness folks as well. But most of you guys that I've talked to that want to start a podcast, I would say it's a complete waste of time. But it's going to help my eighth line of revenue. Oh, that's true. You might get that one little <laughs> like collagen protein sponsor that gives you 200 bucks a month, right? <laughs> no, it's a complete waste of time. And, and quite honestly, most of them, I would put ours in this category. They ain't that great anyway. I mean, I think we do a decent job of what we do. But unless you're going to be like at a Joe Rogan level or, a, you know, one of these guys that's like monetizing the podcast. And if you're a brick and mortar that only draws from like your competitive radius, I don't see it. I mean, I don't, I don't see the, the benefit in it. I thought this was our get rich scheme podcasting. I thought we had a future. It hasn't worked out that way. We don't, I can't even get that one little like soda drink that my daughter turned me on to. I can't even get them to sponsor. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm not doing maybe this Maybe Woodford right. will be on there. Yeah, Woodford will sponsor us. Well, that'd be weird for a fitness thing. all the time. <laughs> you have to drink a, a whole handle of Woodford for every podcast. That's going to be interesting. Oh, man. Well, thank you for this. 31 Ways to Fail in Fitness Business. This was uh, this was fun. Yeah, man. I enjoyed it. And obviously, that was tongue-in-cheek and just do the inverse of everything we talked about today. But I hope it helps. And we do these once a year annually. And I think the advice was not too dissimilar from last year's advice. But guess what? Hard work basics shit doesn't change so i hope it helps and uh i will we'll be back on this next year and we'll let you know when we roll around to 32 years yeah aren't you 32 how old are you <laughs> i'll be 38 damn it's getting <laughs> old matt was actually the probably the only guy in the company that was born when i opened yeah right other than suzanne who's my partner but yeah most everybody when i'm in a room speaking matt i'll say how many of you guys in the room were born after 1992 and i would say 60 percent of the hands go up or more I'm like, great. So you were like twinkling your dad's eye when I was already training people. Started first personal trainer ever. No internet. No internet. No tech stack. No money. I had to explain it. Monopoly money. No money, nothing. And speaking of sleeping with clients, like I could have had a totally different career trajectory had I been the one that slept with Madonna instead of the next trainer. Because the guy that came after me was the one that slept with her. And then they had a baby together. So had I not had strong professional boundaries. So I want you guys to know I live by these rules that I'm talking about today. I would have slept with Madonna. It wasn't for lack of her trying. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> then I would have had a baby with her. And I'm going to leave it at that. So you guys just chew on that. And we will catch up with you guys next week. Matt, I appreciate you. Another great year. And, yes, sir. Uh, all right. See you soon. Word. Peace.